So today we're going to talk about polycystic ovarian syndrome, or PCOS as we're going to call it through the rest of the video. This is a, an illness that we're seeing more and more in females. It's something that unfortunately has a wide range of symptoms and the treatments tend to vary and depends if you're seeing somebody who has a traditional background versus a functional medicine background versus somebody who kind of does all of the above. It's something that we want to get in control of because potentially up to 30% of people, maybe even a little bit higher, may have infertility associated with it. And we want to try to limit that as much as we can. Let's go through the basics here. Polycystic ovarian syndrome is usually a combination of three things. It's a combination of hyperandrogenism, meaning that you're having too much usually testosterone and or DHEA sulfate. The second thing that we're associated with it is you're going to have elevated insulin levels or her and then you also may have hirsutism, which is being too hair growth, too much hair growth, as well as ovarian dysfunction and or infertility. So either problem conceiving or inability to conceive because of the PCOS. So here's some other facts for you before we go do a deeper dive. In. Only about 10 to 30% of women who have been diagnosed with PCOS actually have cysts on their ovaries. So if your gynecologist says, we don't see any cysts on your ultrasound, you don't have PCOS. Time to go find somebody else. That's not the only factor that we're looking for. There's different types depending on which category you're looking at. Every organization has different criteria for what it means, some combination of what your hormone levels are, be it your free testosterone, we look at free testosterone, we look at sex hormone binding globulin. Sex hormone binding globulin binds your testosterone. Um, we'll get into that more in a minute. And what your DHA dash S R. It depends on your AMH or your body, your fertility capabilities, also the hair growth. There's different systems which makes things a little bit more complicated. It's like every country having different ways that they count different currencies. It's harder to figure out where you are relative to anybody else. But we're going to break through this one by one. And again, there are treatments that have been shown that work both traditionally and holistically. So let's go step by step here. We know the main issue is the body's increase in androgen levels, like we said. This is caused by a couple different things. It's caused by elevated insulin levels or insulin resistance. This leads to part of the ovary, the fecal layer to become hypertrophied or enlarged and leads to more testosterone. 25% of the testosterone is coming from the ovary. 25 is becoming from your adrenal gland, which is where we're concerned with we're on the DHEA. And then 50% is from the rest of your body, including your pituitary. So it's multifactorial how we look at it. We want to try to limit the body's production of androgen by blocking the androgens. We also want to limit the insulin resistance and then potentially factors that are causing it. So let's break that down a little more specifically. So what do we do in terms of the androgens? That can be done traditionally. Usually it's done through medicines like Finestra, which has its own side effects, or spironolactone, which probably also, which is, has probably the least amount of side effect, except for the fact we are, it's a sledgehammer. So we're taking testosterone that may be high, and then we're making it low. Even in a female, females need testosterone. They need testosterone to build muscle, which has so many benefits. When they need testosterone for brain function, you need testosterone for energy, you need testosterone to make estrogen, and women need estrogen, obviously. So spironolactone is great to start. You see how it works, how you feel on it, what your lab work comes back. That is potentially the best medicine to start on. There are med supplements like salt palmetto and stinging nettles and bromelain that may help with the androgen side effects. They're not as good, but they're things that are much more natural and don't have as many side effects. Then we want to control the insulin levels. That's why women go on metformin who have PCOS. It helps to regulate your insulin levels. It's the safest, simplest medicine that's out there. Very minimal side effects, except it can long-term may have some issues with women, people building muscle in general who take it. Many different benefits of taking metformin. Other new medicines that are out there, one is called exenatide, which is a longer acting diabetic medication. Other some of the other ones as well, like liraglutide, actually are stronger, they work better, may have less side effects, they may also decrease some of the inflammation associated with PCOS. So those are things that we're looking into. You can also look into taking supplements like uh, berberine. I prefer using dihydrate berberine, which is much stronger in terms of its ability to make insulin work better. You can use things like chromium, alpha lipoic acid, all these different things that help your body use insulin in a much more appropriate manner. And if your body can use insulin better, it's not insulin resistant, that may lead to the limit the connection to the elevated androgens and testosterone. So that's two parts. If we want to get the insulin under control, we get the androgens under control. And if we get that part under control, we can hopefully get the increased hair growth under control. The spironolactone or aldactone, which is the brand, is 
very helpful in terms of that. There are other things that we can tend to use to help potentially help limit the hair growth. The things we talked about before, things like sting nettles and bromelain, they're not as good, they're not as strong, but those are things that we can try to use. But a lot of times the hair growth is overwhelming, we would probably have to switch to the prescription medications. Third part we talked about briefly is we have an issue with the ovary. Part of the issue with the ovary is a mitochondrial dysfunction. Mitochondria is the energy part of your cell. It's the infrastructure of your cell and the ovary to help it make it work and helps with fertility. So we are now looking into things that help augment the mitochondria, things like CoQ10 or MitoQ. We're looking at giving the body what's called MOTC, which is a peptide. This is being in some initial studies right now. We've tried use things like alpha lipoic acid, which helps the cell. People are now using NAD formulations, which have not been fully studied. There's even some proposals to potentially look into a product, a cancer drug called rapamycin, which we know helps to decrease inflammation and boost autophagy and help the mitochondria work better. This is being studied in a lot of women with infertility issues, and this may be the future, if how, depending how these smaller studies go. And then we have the last piece that we're talking about in terms of polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is the risk of infertility. It's gonna start by them at least getting, looking at the labs like anti-malarian hormone, which is AMH, to check on your ovarian reserve. That is gonna give the doctors an idea of where your fertility lies in the spectrum. If it is low, there are things that you can do to definitely augment it. So it's not something that's a, a, a sentence where you're just not gonna have, be able to have children. It's something we need to work on. Again, it's a combination now we're finding of fixing the mitochondria, doing things to help the ovary work more efficiently. It, there's a lot of supplements out there. There are people on that that are using stem cells and exosomes. There's a lot of different ways that we can work to increase the fertility. There is hope. There's a lot of research being pushed into the funding of trying to evaluate in female infertility and ovarian dysfunction and polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is one of the bigger causes of infertility in females. There are, there's hope. It's just going to take some time. One thing to not consider using unless it's something that you're taking for something else are birth control pills. You already have a plenty of hormonal issues between your insulin resistance, potentially being your testosterone being high, your DHA being high, your sex hormone binding globulin being low. If you're going to take on top of that a birth control pill, which is going to further suppress your hormones, your estrogen and progesterone, it's going to put you in a very difficult state where it may be much more, much harder for you to conceive. You may have more, more hair issues. You may go from hair growth to hair loss. You may have decreased energy. You may have brain fog. So unless you need the birth control pills for other conditions, endometriosis, fibroids, very heavy menstrual bleeding, do not consider birth control pills as your primary cause. So to summarize here, with PCOS, you pretty much, we have four things we're looking at. We have the elevated androgens and testosterones. We have the insulin resistance. We have the mitochondrial dysfunction, an issue with the ovary, and then we have the infertility. With a lot of other problems, now you don't wanna just target one thing. You wanna hit each of those pieces separately to make sure you're maximizing your treatment. A lot of those treatments can be done naturally. The one prescription I would tend to recommend above all of those would be L-Dactone, but we'll see as there's new research coming out monthly. So so if you have any questions, put them below. If you like the video, please like it and share it. And please subscribe to the channel and see you guys soon.